Nikki Romano convinced the history of art and design and current awareness courses in the extended curriculum programs of the Faculty of Informatics and Design at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Having worked in the field of graphic design and visual art for many years, Nikki diffracts her practices as visual artist and teacher through a post-constructivist perspective of the relieving curriculum and the becoming uh, and the becoming curriculum in order to support design uh, students' transition into the first year experience in the academy. Her research is concerned with developing art history pedagogical strategies and methodologies that respond effectively to the contingencies arising out of current debates around the call to decolonize the academy in South Africa. In the context of polarized local and global politics, as an educator, as an educator, Nikki works with design students as they seek to navigate differences in the classroom in order to critique unequal power relations, embrace differences, and model compassionate behaviors that promote social justice. To this end, she examines how arts-based practices contribute to building socially just pedagogies in higher education in South Africa. Nikki completed her, her uh, MFA at uh, Michael Schools of Fine Art in 2013 and is currently registered to do her PhD in higher education at the University of the Western Cape. The floor is yours once again. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to present. <laughs> oh wait, I need my presentation, sorry. So there's no way of sharing it with the people? Oh, no, no. Yeah. And you can't see it with you? No. I can, but no, I'll turn it off. Okay. So when Bib suggested that I respond to Erin Manning's presentation, I was so excited because I draw a lot from her writings about research creation, the minor gesture, as well as her ideas about the thinking and the act in my own research. However, my excitement was short-lived because I've struggled to respond to this particular paper. In fact, it's becoming my nemesis, didn't it? <laughs> Not because I disagree with its arguments and conclusions, far from it but mostly because I fear, or I have feel, at a loss for words. Because I'm more fluent in the visual world, I embark on a process of response that goes beyond written word. Before I tell you about the process, which is ongoing, by way of context, let me tell you about what I do, where I work, and what my research is about. I'm a student, designer, visual artist, and educator not necessarily in that order. My work explores ways of learning through current encounters with artworks. My PhD project is entitled Reconfiguring a History of Art and Design Curriculum in the South African University of Technology, Becoming with Critical Arts-Based Pedagogical Encounters. It is located at the Faculty of Informatics and Design at the District 6 campus of CPUT, where I teach history of art and design. Many of you will have visited our campus yesterday afternoon and will have experienced the troubled hauntings of the site. They remind us of ongoing contestations and injustices in South African higher education, both past and present. There are many complexities and ambivalences associated with the teaching and learning of art and design history in South Africa. For one, it's a discipline that's both founded on and embodies Eurocentric cultural hegemonies that are embedded in both theory and institutional and pedagogical practices. As its gaze shines light on the mantle of Western European <coughs> superiority, so it simultaneously obliterates indigenous cultural production. 
So on the one hand, while there's a plethora of images and resources and research to draw from within the Western canon, so there's a gaping, a gaping hole of absence back at home. In the context of these absences, these lacunae, my PhD research explores pedagogical possibilities that foreground students co-effective encounter, encounters with art and design history in order to make visible students' experiences and knowledges, so as to affirm how these knowledges are central to their learning and how they matter. Of concern, therefore, is finding ways of putting art and design to work in order to make visible the gerents of possibilities that these disciplines or practices offer not only teaching and learning, but also the ontological effects on students as becoming designers in the 21st century. Much of our discussions around decolonizing the curriculum in South African higher education center around voice, situated knowledges, foregrounding students' lived experiences, interrogating our pedagogical practices, and experimenting with different modes of learning. For example, I seek to work with art history in ways that do not render those students whose indigenous knowledges and histories that have been systematically been excluded to experience feelings of deficit due to lack of cultural capital. Moreover, contrary to deficit discourses that tend to position students, and I teach mostly first year students, as unable to deal with complexity, how can we engage open-ended processes that build students' confidence in engaging with discourses without fear of getting them wrong? <clears throat> so as a student, I know about this fear of getting it wrong. Let me elaborate. What would happen if I applied the same approach to my becoming with Manning's text? And how could art and design be put to work in this regard? In a way, how could I approach the text the way I would encourage my students to? Manning returns to the medieval understanding of art, which he describes as a way of learning that acts as a bridge toward new processes and new pathways, highlights the generative possibilities that an aesthetics of experience offers learning, offers learning. She writes, to speak of a way is to dwell on the process itself, on its manner of becoming. It is to emphasize that art is before else a quality, a difference in kind, an operative process that maps the way toward a certain attunement of expression and expression. In referring to the Greek etymological roots of design, Kostas Tzedis writes, design is about incompleteness, indefiniteness or imperfection. And that, in its largest sense, design signifies not only the vague, intangible, or ambiguous, but also the strive to capture the elusive. Drawing on and from the above quotations, what follows is a multiple mapping of my thinking about radical pedagogy <coughs> as an attunement to what seeds are thinking in the act. When Manning's paper popped into my inbox, I immediately opened the document and began to read through it. As previously mentioned, my initial excitement was replaced by a sense of total overwhelm at the task that I had undertaken. It felt insurmountable. I read the paper. I read it again and again. I drank tea. I read it again. I drank coffee. I read it again. I read it and read it and read it. But by the end of all of that, I was at a loss for words. I felt tongue-tied. Is this how my students feel when they enter and encounter the academy and its texts? Voice. I needed to find my voice. Here's the irony. What if I read them? <laughs> what if I read Manning's paper out loud? <laughs> <laughs> and record it on the computer. <laughs> what would happen if I give voice to the very words that left me feeling dumbfounded? <laughs> How would reading aloud and hearing myself speak thicken the experience and my understanding? Could reading, listening, offer a different pathway through the text? 
how would this process affect my becoming? And so, I read out loud. <laughs> I stuttered, I repeated, I, stam I stammered, and something shifted. Scene three. When claiming the interstices, this should be the work of the maps that we trace. The maps we must return to them constantly, to what they should be and what they aren't, key as they are in the workings of the network. The maps of these recent times had a fault. They transcribed a recent event. We made them talk. They always turned around what had just happened, what was happening at the, that moment. But the real work of the maps is to retrace the wonder line of the child and to notice that this wonder line escapes us, that we do not catch all that might be the child's project, to note that the wonder lines are magnetized by something. Whilst listening, I was drawn to the visuals of the sound wave traversing the screen. Neat, parallel, vertical lines, equidistant from their horizontal axes. Little soldiers marching in formation against a clear, white background. I set out to document my practice as a good researcher should and using my phone filmed the voice memo clip that translated the text. On watching the video, I was astonished, in fact bedazzled. In filming the computer screen with my phone, the different refreshing frequencies of the respective devices revealed animated patterns of difference that shimmered in the spaces between and beyond the lines of the sound waves. So um, just as Manning encourages us to move beyond the site of the university. This recording that I'm going to show you now was done on, um, at home, actually, on my bed. But I'm just giving you a warning, my dogs were also present. <laughs> Part two, meeting my then. And note the lines that start to be It is an ethos that challenges method. It asks what moves across experience that evades the frame. Transversality is its own. I try to get rid of the dots of concept, <laughs> reminding us that in excess of what moves between is the force that shifts the force that shifts the shape of the encounter. Trans is not inter; it is across. What did those lines conjure up? <coughs> the objective flow was mesmerizing. How could what seemed to be empty space become so saturated with energy? How did a simple slippage between the device's screens amplify so much that otherwise would have gone unseen? I was struck by the uncanny resonances with Guattari's notion of metamorphism as an excess of the model, of all that escapes the model. The patterns of difference reminded me of the silenced and invisible voices, both from the then and there, and the here and now. Manning writes that the indefinite runs through the child, protecting it from the friends we so eagerly wish to impose on it. The becoming child promises no return to an innocent beginning. There is no innocent child, uh, inner child. What there is in every line is an indeterminate tendency for resonating with what else moves across it. This is the becoming line of the child. Now, in the context of design, to draw is defined as a process of producing a picture or diagram by making lines, marks, or tracings on the surface. What would happen if I drew with Manning's texts? What new understanding might emerge through these entangled encounters? The etymological roots of to draw come from the old English dragon, dragon, which is to drag and retract, the Proto-Germanic to draw and pull, in the Middle Dutch to carry, bring, and throw. How might these lines draw out ideas? How might these lines draw from ideas? What would these drawn thoughts carry? Rather than shuffle back and forth between the pages of the paper, I wanted to grasp the entire text as in a single plane. So in order to do this, I set out to place each page into a large square format 
and you can see it. Um, which proved tricky because 13 pages are not easily distributed in, in a square. As you can see, page 13 is split evenly into three sections on the right-hand side, and then I saved it as a PDF. We learned from Manning that Deleuze foregrounded the indefinite article in relation to the child, a child, in order to approximate the quality of moving that troubles the inscription. The indefinite addresses all that escapes the line. Using my iPad and pencil, I began to inscribe my thinking with Manning's text. The following images are evidence of these meanders through and around the words. I adopted various enabling constraints in order to excavate different levels in the text. These included, and I'm not showing them to you in order, tracing and linking the indefinite articles, A, N, any. I also traced the definite articles and conjunctions. I was quite keen to connect all the present continuous verbs, the coming, worlding, childing, making, drawing, learning. I also linked together words that reference the visual, such as image, diagram, and draw. I wanted to see what the networks of these parts of speech would reveal about their relationship to each other. I wanted to understand the excess of the text, the more than of knowledge, and see its possibilities for thinking differently. As I continued to seek new possibilities for knowledge creation, that troubles linguistic dominance and amplifies difference within the life between the lines. I'm hesitant to sum up or conclude, because as I mentioned at the start, the process of drawing with voice and of speaking through lines are ongoing. I would, however, like to share some learnings that these encounters have generated thus far. <clears throat> Please note that these are not in any order of significance or hierarchy. The drawings seem to make visible a thinking through, a mark making that affirms different ways of knowledge creation that do not privilege the discursive which is particularly relevant to design speech students who speak with the visual. The diagrams perform a figuring out of the complexities and ambiguities associated with teaching and learning art history in South Africa. While the lacuna amplify the absence of silent voices and hidden histories, at the same time, they materialize as generative matrices of new pathways for of potential towards making, as, towards the thinking and the act. As I wander through these networks, I also become aware not only of the gaps in my knowledge and research, but that they also point me towards as yet uncharted fields of discovery. While the, connection opens, the connections open us towards rhizomatic thinking as a counter to the dominance of the strictures of the linear, the discursive, and the arboreal, within the academy, the lines create new pathways towards reconceptualizing knowledges and how they are created. Returning to our present assemblage, our coming together from all over the world, both in the real and the virtual space, to talk about the reconfiguring of higher education at a conference situated at this campus, UWC, Bush University, in the city of Cape Town, top tourist destination of the world, an apartheid city, in this country at this time. I wonder whether the images, like the haunting poetry we witnessed yesterday, reveal not only that which remains hidden and, unsp and unspoken, but also the struggle to give voice to that that still remains unspeakable. In their session yesterday, Fagila and Sadiq referenced seeds and seeding and lapping and layering. Their thinking seems to resonate with Manning, Manning's thinking about radical pedagogy as an attunement to what seeds the thinking in the act. Thank you. Um, I know we are 
out of time. Shall we give um, maybe five minutes for uh, questions or comments? We will try to connect with uh, Eric. Anybody wants to speak? Say something? Yes. Well, I want to just say thank you for reading it, and I was so impressed how you could read it so beautifully. No, I think also I'm kind of relieved that you didn't read it for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also thank you for this really just so beautiful response to the paper. You know, I'm just a little lost for words. I wanted to ask you in the, um, about this moment that you describe as being tongue-tied before you get into all of what then follows, and if you had any, I'm looking into stress, and is that moment of fear and being disabled also, you think of a moment of knowing, knowing being stuck, or of unknowing, uh, can we do something with that moment as well before we then go into finding our voice, going into a mode of activation. I don't know if you thought about this. I, I, live, I live with that. <laughs> um, so I think if we can go back to the 100 languages, it's a question of finding the language. So being at, last, at a loss for words doesn't mean I was at a loss to respond. It was really finding the, the, the mode. And that's very much what my arts practice is about, and was about, and I did my masters because Often people would say to me, what is your work about? And I would cry, because I, was, I literally couldn't say what it was about. And that, of course, is stressful. But it wasn't because of stress that I couldn't say it. It was because of the limitations and possibilities of language. So the visual for me, is a, or the, the material, is a, for me a, a, a mode that makes um, that I feel more fluent in. As I said, yeah. Anybody else? May I say, Nikki, we had this discussion yesterday how you would respond to your concern. And I told you, well, the traditional way I would do it is like pick two, three points and comment on them, which is very traditional, very kind of academic. But I have to say, I was very impressed by the way when this visual opened up different ways of, of networks, <coughs> like within the text, mm -hmm. a different way of reading and, and interpreting and feeling it in, in a way that um, I, I wasn't uh, even, even thinking of it. And yeah. today, um, I, I see the possibility. So I have to say, um, you did an excellent job. Um, so
Yeah, <laughs> 